Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is good to see everybody here today for a presentation on the possible and probable Good Faith Chapel. It's coming, it's happening, it's great. I'm going to start with some prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the stewardship that you have entrusted us with, the stewardship of faith and generosity, the stewardship of this community, the Cathedral Parish of St. Philip. We thank you for all who have prayed and worshiped here before us and all who will pray and worship here after us. Give us your wisdom, give us your insight, give us your strength as we gather this morning. We gather and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I am going to spend about 10 minutes. Um, well, first I'm going to introduce uh, the senior warden, Jeff DeLong, who will say something. Then I'll spend a little time talking. Then we'll see a video. Then we'll hear from our junior warden, Melody Palmore. Then from our vicar, George Maxwell, and maybe Dan Murphy, and finally, David Rocchio, and then we'll have questions and perhaps some answers. So that's our, that's our uh, agenda, if you will, as we present the Good Faith Chapel at the Cathedral of St. Philip. I want to uh, introduce to you, if you haven't met Jeff DeLong, our senior warden this year, who has been a steady and consistent support, not only through this year, but for many years before here. Jeff DeLong. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, and welcome to Dean's Forum and presentation on the Good Faith Chapel. Uh, I am Jeff DeLong, maybe better known as Dorsey's husband. Um, but I am honored to be serving you as senior warden, you know, particularly now, because I think we're going to look back and think about this as truly one of the most exciting times in the history of our parish. Sam's going to go through in his presentation, uh, he's gonna walk us through uh, a lot of the practical and uh, aspirational reasons for us to wanna to construct the Good Faith Chapel. But before he does, I'd like to just take a minute and provide you with some historical context uh, and my perspective uh, as a lay person involved throughout this process. So building a, a mid-sized worship space uh, is not a new concept for the cathedral. Um, in fact, the campus master plan, which was developed back in 1998, included a chapel of similar size and architecture uh, located in the same place we hope to build the Good, good, the good Faith Chapel. Um, even before that, plans for building a chapel were conceived in the late 1980s and early 90s. The more recent interest has sparked the need for a conceptual design, which the architectural firm Cooper Carey created for us back in March of 2023. And since spring of 2023, the chapel development process uh, has progressed thoughtfully uh, with the executive committee and chapter overseeing and supporting the design, feasibility, permitting, and fundraising aspects. And this really culminated with the approval of the construction contract at our September meeting, which we just held a few weeks back. And then we finally received approval from the diocese shortly thereafter. So that's a little bit of the history. My perspective uh, throughout this process has really been, braced, uh, been based in gratitude. Um, I'm grateful that our parish is thriving particularly when you see other churches and denominations that appear to be struggling. We have the gift of being able to focus on growth and meeting the needs of our parishioners and planning for the future. This chapel can play a very meaningful role in that future and help us fulfill our mission and ministry as a house of prayer for all people and a cathedral for the city. It will not change our current worship practices. It will provide a holy space that accommodates the ability for us to broaden and deepen our faith experience. So as you consider the chapel 
and you consider your ability and willingness to join us in financially supporting its construction, I invite and encourage you to do so with faith, imagination, and gratitude. And with that, I will turn it over to the Dean. Thank you, Jeff. I, I appreciate the, the history part. Um, I, I've, I, I love talking about the history of the Cathedral Parish of St. Philip, and I love talking about the future of the Cathedral Parish of St. Philip, but I have a hard time reducing it to a span of, of 10 minutes. So let, so let me give you a quick summary. As Salmoon mentioned in the sermon this morning, sometimes we have the dates differently, but St. Philip's Church is the oldest Episcopal church in the city of Atlanta. We were, they were trying to organize something in 1846. We finally got it organized in 1847, right across the street from the Georgia State Capitol. We're at the corner of what used to be Hunter Street and Washington Street. As Atlanta grew, so did the city, uh, so did the structures, and I finally found the photograph that proves what I've been saying for 20 years. Do you, have any of you been to underground Atlanta? Not recently, maybe, but in the old days, it was, it was really happening. And what created underground Atlanta were a series of viaducts built over the train tracks. And I finally found at the Atlanta History Center photograph I've been looking for of St. Philip's Church, a beautiful church in its second building. They built in 1847, built in 1868, a very challenging time to build, and they built in 1892. But after that, the viaducts, the Washington Street viaduct in particular, to go over the tracks, was 10 feet above the front door of St. Philip's Church. I'm taking a guess what 10 feet is, but you can see in the photograph that uh, the street level was above the floor level. There were, and people were, of course, moving north of town. And so the church in 1932, 1933, as Salmu mentioned in the sermon, made a dramatic decision under one of my heroes, Raimundo Dioves, the dean of the time, to move St. Philip's Church, which, which was by then a cathedral, in the American church, um, there were no cathedrals outright until the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, when generally um, the church, the diocese would ask the oldest church in the diocese to serve as a cathedral. And many churches along the colonial coast of the American, of the United States, refused to be a cathedral. They didn't want all that. So that's why um, Diocese of Georgia until recently, Diocese of North Carolina, Diocese of Virginia, they don't have cathedrals. They don't need cathedrals. I mean, nobody needs a cathedral, except we do. We need a cathedral. Um, but there was a lot of dynamic in that state. So we became a cathedral in 1892 for the Diocese of Georgia. In 1904, the cathedral for the Diocese of Atlanta. And in 1932 and 1933, moved. A dramatic change from downtown uh, where the energy was, it was hard to get to church, literally. They moved up here to Peachtree and the dirt road, now known as Andrews Drive. It was a, a, a risky move. It was way out of town. I think it'd be like moving to Johns Creek now or something like that. We're not moving to Johns Creek. Um, but the Jewish congregation had looked at this property and decided it was too far north. And so they stopped at the train station where the temple is now is where they moved. And we got here and rejoiced a year before the Roman Catholics decided they wanted to move and we had the best property already. <laughs> so they've got a little bit down the street. And then there were two Baptist churches that were moving, Second Baptist Church downtown and Ponce de Leon Baptist Church out Ponce de Leon. And when they merged, they didn't want to favor one person's, one church's property or one church's name. They decided to go to a third location up here and combine their names to be second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. There is no first Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. <laughs> it, it's a combination of Ponce de Leon Baptist and second Ponce de Leon. And we created this holy place. Over time, our ancestors here in the church have gathered property. In the early days, all we had was this point. And so some of the photographs of the church have people parking along Peachtree Road, road by the way, not the street, Peachtree Road, and parking 
in the Horseshoe Drive, which was not a drive, it was a parking lot. All the cars were there parked. Some of you may remember this. And the first building was Michael Chapel, the first permanent building. The little gray church on the hill served. And people wandered through the alleys back here. And we, the church had a parking lot about, I guess, two, about a block back there. You all, any of y'all remember parking way back there? You had to come through an alley to get to, to, get to church. Um, so over time, the generosity and faith of parishioners here have acquired lot by lot, by parcel by parcel. So we have about 16 acres, uh, including Cathedral Towers, another dramatic gift to the city and to the church that our um, forebearers in the faith have, have, have accomplished. As Jeff pointed out, there's always been a desire for a mid-sized chapel, a mid-sized worship place. We got Michael Chapel, which serves as a chapel, um, but it's quite small. It's, um, it, we say it holds 90, but it really holds about 75 or 80 comfortably. And then we have the cathedral, which holds about 1,300. And so sometimes families are a little concerned for the funeral or a wedding. Uh, we, we're not going to have as few as 60, but we may have 130 people. Where are we going to have our service? We meet in the cathedral, and the cathedral works. But there's been a vision for a mid-sized chapel. So that's where this vision today comes from in its, in its history. I love Michael Chapel. In fact, I was doing a wedding yesterday, and down there on the wall of the bridal room are many couples who have had their weddings in Michael Chapel, including my own parents. In 1954, they were married in Michael Chapel. If you don't believe me, you can go down there and take a look on the, on the, on the bridal wall. It's been, a, it's been a, a, holy, a holy place. This vision, however, of the Good Faith Chapel would be a solution to that practical need to have a 300-person room, but also a vision for a dramatic new kind of architecture, which would open, I believe, open us to a new kind of prayer, a wider and expansive prayer. We have a beautiful facility now, the cathedral itself. It's the old Gothic style. It's, it's gorgeous. We go to church there because we love it. But there are, other, there are other opportunities for prayer. So what we envision here is an octagonal building, similar to some of the older Christian architectures of, of our religion. Believe it or not, Gothic architecture is a very recent architectural phenomenon, only 800, 900 years old. Before that, there was a more Eastern architecture, which was rounder and sometimes octagonal. Uh, Salmoon Bashir keeps, gave me a book of churches in Georgia, or maybe where Maria is. They're all octagonal, almost all of them. Um, so the Eastern Christian tradition has been a wider kind of open prayer experiences, which is what we hope to do here, following Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Or another great vision is the baptistry outside the Duomo in Florence, Italy, St. James Baptistry. Have any of you ever been to Florence and seen that baptistry? You'll see a beautiful cathedral and then a freestanding octagonal chapel. That's what we envision here. We would continue everything we've got going now at the cathedral. All the services, we wouldn't change anything there. We would simply be expanding an opportunity for prayer that would provide two things, at least, I hope a lot more, but two things in particular. Holiness, to me, is about having an intimate connection with community and a transcendent connection with the divine. So many of you who've been to monasteries or even round circular areas, when you pray in that environment, you see each other better. You see the community and there's a feeling of connecting in that rounder octagonal feature. That's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful to kind of see each other as you're, as you're worshiping. I mean, it's fun to see the altar at the end of a room too, but there's another experience that happens when we're together. The transcendent dimension in this chapel would be quite a new thing as well. There would be no windows on the inside of the chapel. Let me let that sink in. There'd be no windows on the inside of the chapel. You see these windows on the outside here. 
they go into an ambulatory that'll be a hallway around the outside of the interior of the chapel. Inside the chapel would be open on three sides as you come in, but on the five sides facing you as you come in would be screens. These uh, would not be the screens that normally you think of as contemporary music, happy, clappy screens, but they would be screens which could project and show images according to the event, according to the season. Animals on St. Francis Day, fire on Pentecost, resurrection on Easter. Uh, we could even, have, we're thinking these days, to have particular images of the church itself that are a lot more close up. Um, even from time to time, we could show in the chapel the close-ups of our stained glass windows in the cathedral, which most people have never seen close up. You've seen the glory from far away, but the detail is really amazing. Anyway, the, the screens would be ways to enable our worship and create a new sense in there. The stained glass windows we have now, which are some of the most beautiful in the country, are meant to create a new image of the kingdom, a new image of heaven. You, we have our Bible stories, church history stories. Well. In this century, screens can help us to do that. They can create that new home, that new community. There would be one window, and the window would be at the top, around uh, strong acrylic material open to the sky so that we would see the heavens. We would see... Uh, uh, the presence of God in an open, transcendent top among the people of God here. So those are two or three of the dramatic and distinctive features of this, uh, of this good faith chapel. But ultimately, the distinctive feature is it's going to give us an opportunity to pray in an expanded way. And that's been my favorite thing to talk about. I like prayer. In fact, ever since we've been talking about this, I've been walking through the playground, praying for the trees that we're going to probably get rid of, we are going to get rid of, and, and just getting that place accustomed to, they've done lots of prayer there already, I know, with parents and their children in the playground. But um, this would be a place of prayer that would open us to a new sense. It doesn't take anything away from what we're doing now, but it adds to our ability to be a house of prayer for all people in a new way. And that's the reason for the, the name, Good Faith Chapel. It opens us in good faith to new opportunities, maybe prayer for a new generation, prayer for a new century, and in particular, a sign that we really are thriving for the future. We're not just living in a, in a um, fantasy past or a good past even, but we are building for a new generation and a new people, a, a new century. That's the, that's the excitement of the, of the energy of this campaign. So let me stop there. I think in the interest of time, we're gonna show the video and then have people sp speak and then take some, some questions. And if we don't get to all the questions today, I'm gonna to be answering questions for the next five years here. <laughs> so, so ask away and we'll take a look at this video. The Cathedral of St. Philip has been a house of prayer for all people for a long time. And I'm here this morning to talk about a vision, a vision for a good faith chapel, a way to expand our sense of being a house of prayer for all people. For many years, this community has wanted and needed a medium-sized chapel. The good faith chapel would hold 250 to 300 people. And it would be a different kind of architecture, a space that gives us a new way of praying, a round space, which is to say an octagonal space, where we would sense the presence of God among ourselves. This place will be a quiet place, a contemplative prayer room, a meditation room, if you will. There would be one window in the Good Faith Chapel, an oculus that is at the top of the rounded roof. An oculus is an eyepiece 
to the heavens, to the transcendent, an eyepiece to God, if you will. And that way we would be able to sense God's presence in the world around us, in the sky. The Good Faith Chapel will be intentionally variable. There won't be anything permanently fixed in the chapel, even the altar. The altar can be set up in the middle of a room or it could be set up at the edge of the room. Same with chairs. There won't be any fixed pews. In the Good Faith Chapel, we would have screens where we could have different images projected according to the image of the season, image of the day, uh, St. Francis Day, the blessing of the animals, Easter and resurrection, Pentecost and fire. Well, one of the things we think of as we're putting this vision together of a Good Faith Chapel was our worship services during the COVID pandemic when we weren't allowed to be in rooms together, but we could gather outside safely. And we found ourselves gathering in a circle. We found ourselves gathering so we could see each other in a, in a beautiful way. And it was beautiful for us because we could see each other in the flesh. There's a word we use in the Episcopal tradition, the word incarnation. It means in the flesh. We believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. And we believe that God continues to come in the flesh, not just through a medium, <laughs> but, but in person. So this Good Faith Chapel is gonna give us a new way to experience incarnation, a new way to gather together, to be in the flesh together. There are beautiful examples of Christian chapels that are in the round octagonal. One is the baptistry outside the Duomo in Florence, Italy, St. John's Baptistry. It is an octagonal building separate from the beautiful cathedral that's there. We have that image in mind. We think of our Gothic structure as being traditional, but it's not traditional. Gothic was a new thing in its era. The Byzantine architectures, which were octagonal and circular, are much more classical Christian. So in a way, this Good Faith Chapel will plant us in the recent tradition and the ancient tradition. It'll have all that makes us part of a, a holy Christian community. This is it's a great opportunity to have a worship space, a, a multi-use space that has this natural light coming from the heavens. The Good Faith Chapel will be an important part um, for our, our grandchildren, and it's something, it's a legacy that can be there for their future and future generations. This cathedral has always had leadership and has had vision to see what is the future, where is our society going, and how do we become a part of it? And I believe that this chapel is just the next chapter of that. We think about the expansions and the many, many iterations of growth we've had here. This is just the next level. I pray that this Good Faith Chapel continues a tradition of blessing in this place. So blessings to all of you who are watching this video, wherever you are. I hope the Cathedral of St. Philip has blessed you and this parish has blessed you. And I pray that the Good Faith Chapel will be a blessing to you and to the whole world. Amen. I talk a little fast, but I think I was excited when I was talking about that. <laughs> uh, Melody is going to come and say something about uh, her sense of where we are. Melody Palmore, the junior warden of the cathedral. Welcome, Melody. Good morning, and thank you, Sam, and thank you, Jeff, and thank you to all the people who put that beautiful video together. Um, I probably don't even need to speak, <laughs> but um, I am privileged to be able to speak to you as your junior warden and, and grateful for the opportunity to share with you why I am so excited to be a part of or tell you about this um, project, the Good Faith Chapel. As my husband will tell you, I can never tell a story without starting from Genesis. So in the beginning, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, many years ago, my parish church, Christ Episcopal Church in Dayton, Ohio, which is a member of the community of the Cross of Nails, which the Cathedral of St. Philip's is as well, sent to me to Coventry Cathedral in England to participate in their student guide program. 
Coventry Cathedral, as many of you are aware, is a cathedral that was destroyed in hatred during World War II. It was resurrected in forgiveness and now devoted to the Ministry of Reconciliation. The summers I spent in Coventry were great impact in my life. Um, they served as a great impact in my life, not only because it was a turning point in my life, um, but it also served to enrich my spiritual life as well. And what I want to share with you about Coventry this morning is that they had round chapels. I want to speak to you in particular about one of them, the Chapel of Unity. This was across from the baptismal font and served as a meeting point, <clears throat> excuse me, for prayer and study for the creation of mutual trust between Christian leaders of the community and the world. It was an octagonal structure as we've seen in the videos as well and as what Sam has described, but the interior was round. And there is an inscription on the floor of that chapel that they all may be one. It's inscribed in what was a detailed mosaic floor along with the nations of the world. And that inscription, as you know, is taken from John 17, our Lord's prayer to his father, which set the tone as the chapel ministry was devoted to, not only to the community, but to ecumenical worship. The experience of worshiping in the round in that chapel, being able to really look in each other's face and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the face of God in each of us, thus erasing the divisions that have been, we have constructed to separate us, was an unforgettable and very intimate and very powerful occurrence. The summers I spent in Coventry, as mentioned, really changed my life. And that was one of the most important things that happened to me there. We now have the opportunity to bring this form of prayer and worship to our midst. And this fills me, besides my shaking voice, with joy and excitement. So I am so thrilled that we are growing into the future, utilizing an ancient Christian tradition, as Sam has explained to us, creating a unique space whereby we can welcome and engage all Christians, enriching not only our relationship with God, but the communities as well. So I'm inviting you to join me in my joy moving forward as we build the Good Faith Chapel, a new and powerful welcoming place for contemplative prayer in our cathedral home that is a house of prayer for all people, expanding our ministry in our parish and to the city of Atlanta and to the world. And thank you for this privilege of sharing with you. Who's that? George? David? Y'all don't want to do anything? So I think we're skipping George and Dan and going to David. That's what Dan said. What's that? Oh, Q&A first. Q&A for the next three years, five years, <laughs> 10 years. So um, again, we've got lots of logistical questions and Dan knows, Dan knows some of it, George does, and then David's going to come talk about some of the financial features of it. So. Questions, Joe Estes, Let, use, use a mic and then give it back to Brad. Thank you, great job. Um, you've talked about 
the fact that our programs as they exist today won't change. We'll continue to have the Sunday school, and the worship services, and so forth and so on. Presumably those will exist as they currently exist in either Michael Chapel or in the cathedral itself. But you haven't told us about the programs you contemplate hosting in here. Can you spend just a few minutes about that? Yes, thank you, that's good. What I'm saying in particular is that our worship experiences won't change. The worship services we have in the cathedral and in Michael Chapel will stay as they are now in beautiful ways. We do anticipate you moving perhaps some programs into this space. During the day, um, it would be a quiet place. It would be a meditation place where um, people can come and pray without the hustle and bustle, the necessary hustle and bustle that's often in the cathedral and in other places as well. Um, this would be a, a quiet place, but it's also the open place where things like the Dean's Forum could meet there, Old Fashioned Sunday School could meet there. Sometimes our children's worship places are too small. Oftentimes they're meeting in St. Mary's Chapel. We move all the floors and the children are out there and they're all over the place. The, the Good Faith Chapel with a carpet would be a lot more comfortable along those areas. There are also the chances for some contemplative prayer services that wouldn't compete with services that are going on now, but at different times of the day, that kind of thing. That makes sense. The <laughs> other people can... Inter interfaith opportunities. Sure, sure. We often have interfaith opportunities in here, but we could do that in the, in the Good Faith Chapel as well. Perfect. Yes, Ben. Will there be an organ? No. There, will, there, will there be an organ? No, there won't be an organ. There'll be nothing fixed in the room. Um, we can move a portable organ in there. We can move a string quartet in there. We can move a piano in there. The altar will be movable. The, there'll be no fixed pews. There'll be chairs. So everything can vary according to... There might be some things that I can't even imagine that will, that will be there. Yeah. Is there uh, any plan for fixed lighting? And it just if, you know, if it's dark or bad weather? Is there any plan for fixed lighting is the question. Dan, can you answer that? I can, yes, there is lighting. So you can see in that image that you're looking at there, there is some, some backlighting. There's also um, four big uh, sort of pointed lights because of the variability of the room, either setting the altar in the center or at the end, that, those lights will be able to move according to how the service is set up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. These questions are quick. One, one more thing, yeah. So you referred to no happy clappy. Sorry? You referred to no happy clappy. Yeah, I don't to know. To quote you, so does that mean we're not looking at a new style of worship that will take place in this space? Or? People, that, that's, a, that, that's a very legitimate question and I don't have a, I don't have a secure answer because I don't know what we're gonna look like in 50 years, but I don't anticipate doing what might be called a contemporary music service in there, or prayer and praise, and they're, they're, they're called different kinds of things. It's not, it won't be prohibited, it might, it might happen in there, but that's not the reason for it. It, it really is an open, uh, imaginative place. And that's about what I was, I was gonna say. Part of what excites me here is the ability to pray in a holy place that's gonna produce some new ideas, some, some new, creativity. Um, it, whatever worship we do at the cathedral is going to be decently and in order. <laughs> Let's put it that way. The, the old Anglican phrase uh, of something that builds the best of our tradition but opens us up to, uh, to great, like our, our Taz A services could go in there that are often here. We have a labyrinth that we roll out in, the, in this place and roll back up and there's beautiful Taze services that go on in Michael Chapel. They could happen in the, in the Good Faith Chapel. And in fact, right now our plan is that the carpet in the Good Faith Chapel would have embroidered into it the Chart Cathedral Labyrinth. So that would be the floor plan. Yeah. So Adam. Sam, could I imagine Jazz Vespers taking place in the space? <laughs> I had Jazz Vespers this morning at 7.15 in the cathedral. 
That's where I was playing jazz piano. And if you come to Sunday morning cathedral, it'll wake you up. <laughs> I don't know. I, if, any, with God, everything is possible. <laughs> Two questions here. Sam, I've got a question about the technology with the screens. I mean, right now, this looks really easy. Somebody's sitting there with a laptop, and we've got great images. Will it be easy for lay people who want to come in and maybe have something rather than a blank screen? I'll let Dan answer that, too. Um, I, as with a lot of things here at the cathedral, we anticipate that it would, uh, it would require somebody like a, a Brant or Joseph, who are our AV technicians, to come in and, and set those screens. So during the day, they might be kind of on a still, uh, still image or very slow moving, something to, to set the tone of the room. Uh, during a service, as we do with every service in the cathedral, we would anticipate a, one of our professional technicians to be in there. Yeah, we will have some, we will have some uh, Stewardship. We don't want anything shown on the streets. <laughs> if, if you follow me, go ahead. To what extent will the rest of the campus be impacted by the construction? I, I can't quite picture how it connects. And will you be able to be and you know have weddings here without seeing construction and being? This is a very important question. It will disrupt us to a degree. I didn't mention exactly where the place is, but the, over there on that diagram, you'll see that the. Good Faith Chapel in octagonal form will essentially mirror the octagon of the atrium as we come in, and you'll go all the way down that hall and keep on going past the gold room into an entrance to the Good Faith Chapel. During the construction, Andrew's Drive would be disrupted. That is the entrance to the cathedral from Andrew's Drive. The playground is being moved to uh, the the preschool portion of the of the campus. So no longer would the children be coming through here back and forth, which I always enjoy, but sometimes the teachers don't enjoy it so much. Andrew's Drive, as I remember it, is going to be closed Monday through Friday. Am I getting this right? That's correct. And it will be one way in on Saturdays and Sundays. Correct. That's going to be disruptive. It, it, it'll, it'll be a challenge, Dan. As, as part of that, though, we are working with traffic engineers, obviously, that sends all of the traffic or more traffic through uh, the Rumson Peachtree Road entrance. So we're working with traffic engineers to, um, to, to get cars moving in a, in a more smooth fashion than you would imagine if, if everybody had to go at the, the light timing as it is now. Does that make sense? Did you have a question, Sam? Uh, yeah. Hold it, get a mic. Compared to the cathedral, how big is the chapel going to be? Okay, compared to the cathedral, I don't know. The best comparison would be to compare it to the atrium. It's going to be about as big as the exterior wall of the atrium. The interior of the atrium is an octagon, but this octagon would go out to the exterior walls. Isn't that about right, David? And um, I don't know exactly how to compare it to the cathedral. One of my questions I see... Sam and Alex sitting here, somebody had asked uh, at some point a couple of weeks ago, who's going to design the work of the, the screens? Who's going to put all that AV together? The next generation is going to put all that together. <laughs> so y'all are now enlisted to, put, to, to, to help with that. Other questions? These are good Sam, questions. Sorry. I have a question. Sam, what will be the basic layout of the room and then where do you store things like the movable altar the piano the organ any of the things that you want to bring in for um, special effects or special services looking at this i don't see any storage room unless it's underground you, where is it? you are asking the right question mr roger moister so here's the answer the basic layout will be kind of an open room for meditation and, and prayer and contemplation. It may change from season to season, but the basic layout will have some chairs, perhaps with cushions that you can kneel or sit on. However, if you look on your diagram, you'll see the octagon, but on the peach tree side, you'll see a little notch, a little hall that's actually an elevator shaft. It is a freight elevator that will go down, as you just correctly 
speculated to a basement under the Good Faith Chapel. And that elevator would take all the movable pieces down to that open floor and then back up. It won't, that open basement floor will not connect, however, to the existing first floor of the cathedral. We, the construction people have said that's, that's, we can't get through there <laughs> without disrupting things even more. So that will be the only way to get down to that basement level of the Good Faith Chapel is through those stairs and the freight elevator in that little notch to the side that you can see in the diagram. Sam. Yes, wherever you are. There. Can you share with us a little bit about once it's all in place and, and we're enjoying it, what the incremental financial load will be on the annualized budget? Um, I can share that there will be an incremental increase. In <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly what that number is. In fact, I might ask, this might be a good time to have turned to my colleague, David Rocchio, <laughs> and, uh, and add to that. Thank you for that well time. <laughs> We've got only two or three minutes, and we're not going to get, get everybody's question in, but we'll be around for further things. David, thank you for all you've done on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Walker. Um, so it will go up a little bit, but we also think that there, there will be some possible um, revenue possibilities uh, with it as well. So it may go up modestly. There's some offsets, um, both in how we can use that space, but also how it frees up space like Child Hall, because, uh, you know, uh, George is not doing old fashioned Sunday school necessarily on here on a Sunday morning. So we can flip this room quicker. We can use it for more uh, activity like that. And maybe, of course, we hope ultimately that this is attracting new members for sure. That's one of the primary reasons for doing it. So I just want to say a couple things, obviously. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm David Rocchio, the director of stewardship here at the cathedral. And um, I, I want to say a few things about the fundraising aspect um, and then just a couple maybe logistical questions if, if folks have them. First, fundraising. Um, I want to start with just that I love you all. Uh, you all have loved on me for the past 18 years. You're a wonderful congregation. This is a wonderful congregation to work for. Um, and this is a congregation that has been loving uh, itself and, and the city and the world uh, for, you know, since 1846. It's incredible. Um, everything that we see here uh, was built by our predecessors, was built by generations before us um, to, to build up and lift up the church. Uh, we are in an incredible opportunity to build new worship sacred space on campus for the following generations. It's a real opportunity for us um, to grow the church into the future and lead into the future uh, for this congregation and for uh, the Episcopal Church and for Christianity. We started this process in, in formally in uh, spring of last year. We didn't really have a concept of how much it was gonna cost, but we've moved forward and uh, understand through all our design process that roughly, this will roughly cost about $31 million to construct this chapel. It's a lot of money. On the back of this brochure, you can kind of see the, the rough buckets of how that money is going to be spent. I'm delighted, ecstatic, uh, to say we've raised almost 27 million of that. Um, and... I want to thank some of those donors that are in this room. They were that early money that said, yeah, we, we, we believe in this. We believe in the vision. We believe in Sam's vision. We believe in the need for the congregation. We're excited. That has obviously built and built and built. Um, we just need four million. That's all we need. Um, we can do this. It is so doable. And so uh, we want you all to participate. Obviously, we think this will be a stronger campaign with more people participating. Um, we will be sending out packets in the next few weeks. You, should, you will get them in the mail. Here's what they're going to look like, though. I'll just to, to give you a preview. We want you to be thinking about a gift that's roughly three to five times your annual gift to be spread out over three to five years. Okay? So that's the general um, uh, algorithm uh, for how we're figuring this out. Some people have done multiples of, of, of 50 or 100 times their annual gift, which is incredible. And some folks might be able to do one time their annual gift. 
we're gonna be grateful for anything and everything that you can give us. Um, but our goal is to get to that remaining four million. Uh, and I think we can do it. So look out for those packets in the next couple of weeks. In the same t at the same time, if you wanna talk to me earlier or talk to the dean earlier, we're, we're all ears. Uh, my phone number is 404-663-2838. Give me a call. Um, I'm happy to talk. And then I just wanna say just a couple things logistically and we can follow up with any, with any remaining questions. Just, um, we are gonna get started in early November. We've got a great architectural team, we've got a great engineering team, we've got a great staff team internally, and we have an incredible builder. So you saw Beth and Tommy Holder on the screen a few minutes ago. This is Tommy's church, he was baptized here a long time ago. Um, he's not in the room, so I can say that. His firm is going to build this chapel. It will be state-of-the-art, it will be well-built, we will be well taken care of in this construction process. That process will start in early November. As Sam said, the disruption outside will mostly be along that Andrews um, uh, corridor. Inside, we'll lose some hallway space and access to the Gould Room from the hallway. Otherwise, we'll still have access to the Gould Room through this room. Otherwise, inside, very minimal disruption, uh, particularly on Sundays and on worship at worship times. That process will take about 18 months, so we'll start in November and finish around May of 2026. What I wanted, the last thing I wanna invite you all to though is November 10th, when we will have a ceremonial groundbreaking. So please come back the same time in just a few weeks where we will literally shovel some dirt and get this project started. Uh, and we invite you all to be a part of that as well. We'll have, we'll have things that you can actively do that morning to be a part of this process. I'll give it back to Sam, thank you. We couldn't, we couldn't be where we are today without David's ministry here. This is not just the place where David Rocchio works. This is where David Rocchio prays. And whatever financial generosity we can give, I really want us to be generous in our prayer. So please pray. Um, I hope we've always prayed for the cathedral, but especially right now, it's, it's gonna be a dramatic thing. And I hope this prayer is gonna set us up for even new levels of our own spirituality and our own prayer. So thank you for your prayer and your generosity. Let us bless the Lord and go to church. <laughs>